Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Coyle. And those really are two wonderful and very detailed talks. And mine is going to build a little bit on things that you heard from Dr. Markowitz uh, about the medicines themselves, uh, concepts that you've now been thinking about based on Dr. Cohen's look at vaccination and kind of putting the, the rubber to the road in terms of how do we think about choosing disease modifying therapies, differentiating amongst them and trying to personalize our treatment choices, which is the great problem that we have in our field now because we have so many options, at least for relapsing forms of the disease. Here are my disclosures. I do work in a consultative capacity with a, a few of the um, companies that are working on MS medicines. Uh, we don't do any promotional talks or programs um, being a Mount Sinai faculty member. So nothing I say here will be promotional for anything in particular. So. What I'm going to try to do with a, just a few slides is replicate, kind of demonstrate how we think uh, when we are sitting down with an MS patient and deciding what disease-modifying therapy to choose. And so I'm not going to go very deep into the individual medicines. You've actually heard a really nice overview of some of the nuances between them from Dr. Markowitz, but how do we use this information in practice? So to begin, let's just put a summary out on the table of our existing disease-modifying therapies. And as I said, I'm not gonna go deep into it, but we do have a very nice uh, downloadable PDF handout that we've developed as part of this program that you can pull down and use as a reference for a lot of the topics uh, and the details on each disease-modifying therapy. But in a more top line way, how can we summarize our field? So we have different mechanisms of action as you've thought about from more selective immune modifiers, broader spectrum non-selective immune modifiers. We have medicines that block the migration of uh, activated lymphocytes. And in particular, those that do so by modulating S1P. And then finally, we have medicines that deplete away entire uh, groups of our immune cells. Here's some medicines that represent those individual categories. Um, and uh, we're gonna talk about these in a little bit of detail. As I think you've heard earlier, we're only gonna use um, uh, generic names as part of this program. It can sometimes be a little challenging in distinguishing some of the newer medicines, but we'll try to make all the points using the generic names. Finally, we have distinctions between root and frequency of administration from oral, injectable, infusable, and how frequently those things are given. But then where the, you know, where the rubber hits the road is really in the distinction of efficacy, safety, and tolerability. And here I put up the concept that a lot of our thoughts about relative efficacy, relative safety, and relative tolerability are really perceptions, perceptions from the data, from the clinical trials, perceptions from our own practice. And I put that up because I, I'm going to show some relative efficacy, safety, and tolerability, but we don't have head-to-head -head data comparing each one of our medicines to each other. We don't have even that much real-world data with comparative efficacy. So take these with a grain of salt, but ranging efficacy safety and tolerability across our medicines from one plus to four plus. Um, and uh, we're gonna break that down in a moment. Finally, we do have a sense of how much of a track record do we have with these medicines. So here's the year of approval for them. And you've already heard from Dr. Markowitz, the update from the past year or two. And I'm gonna reiterate a little bit of that when we look at our newest medicines that have just come out in the past couple of years. So when we sit down with our patient and we're talking to her about making a DMT choice, I'm going to leave mechanism of action out of it for a moment. Not because it's not relevant, it is. But mechanism of action is not really the thing, I think, that drives the discussion with our patient. It's what we're thinking about in the background. Um, and certainly mechanism of action will have implications for safety, efficacy, tolerability, for vaccines, as you just heard from Dr. Cohen. But rarely do I find myself talking to a patient about disease modifying therapies and saying to her, you know, would you rather a cell depleter or a migration blocker? Because we don't really have yet biomarkers to say that a particular mechanism is going to work for a particular patient. Uh, we will ultimately, but we don't have that yet. So leaving mechanism of action aside, 
when we sit down with the patient, I think probably the lead sort of consideration we have is how well is this medicine likely to work? And that is often one of the most important things to the patient as well. And so let's prioritize efficacy for a second. And here I want to appeal, uh, appeal to a hypothetical case. If you have someone sitting before you that you are worried about from an MS prognosis perspective, perhaps she has had multiple relapses stacked one on top of another in recent times. Perhaps those relapses have had a more prognostically concerning set of symptoms, motor symptoms, weakness, gait failure, cerebellar or brainstem symptoms. That would be of concern. Perhaps you're looking at her lesion burden and a high lesion burden, particularly in the brainstem and in the spinal cord, really drive our prognostic considerations. That's something very important to me, lesion localization. Um, it's part of how I view clinical course in MS through something I've called the topographical model of MS, which really ties lesion location to symptoms and prognosis. But even if you're not thinking in those terms, you're just looking at a patient and you think to yourself, I'm worried about her. I'm worried about her and I want to prioritize the highest efficacy medicines. Well, then we kind of mentally shuffle the deck of treatments and prioritize them from most efficacious down to least. And, you know, at the initial disease modifying therapy decision, I think most of us don't necessarily use alemtuzumab as a first line medicine. Its approval in the United States is really for second or third line breakthrough disease, but it is one of our most effective medicines, as is ocrelizumab and natalizumab. So those three monoclonal antibodies, very high efficacy. Um, and you saw in Dr. Markowitz talk, you know, we look at no evidence of disease activity, NIDA, as being a treatment goal. And these medicines are, have been the most likely to achieve that. Um, Mitazantrone, we don't use that much in clinical practice. Uh, oral cladribine is another higher efficacy oral option. We can argue whether the S1Ps should be in the highest efficacy category or just under that, but nonetheless, I think they are in play when we're focused on efficacy. So we sort of shuffle the deck and a lot of our older self-injection medicines sort of fall away as being not the highest priority. But prioritizing efficacy alone is not how we make our decisions. We've co-balanced that with thinking about safety and the perception of safety. Um, and here, safety is a big category. And the way I tend to think of it is there are adverse events that pose safety concerns, and there are side effects, which are more of tolerability concerns. So here I'm going to focus on risks and safety considerations. And if we're worried about uh, safety for a given patient, perhaps she has more comorbidities, uh, someone who has diabetes, and hypertension, perhaps existing liver disease, perhaps someone who is older and so has per accumulated more comorbidities or just we worry about their health benefits overall, we might prioritize safer medicines because we don't want to aggravate comorbidities. If, for instance, the patient is very worried about safety, um, they are concerned about certain risks, I think that drives our decision also. So for prioritizing the safest medicines, well, then when we shuffle the deck, it's a completely inverted list for the most part to when we're prioritizing efficacy. Now we're thinking about medicines like glitermeracetate or even the injectable interferons, which have been around for 20 plus years, very well-known safety profile. I think it's fair to say that there will be no safety surprises with glitermeracetate or interferons because they've been around for such a long time. Here, I would also point out that natalizumab, highly efficacious medicine, divides into two. And in the efficacy realm, I tend to think about natalizumab as two different medicines if someone is JC virus antibody positive or negative. If a patient is JC antibody positive, that is to say they have a, a lifetime exposure to JC virus. This is not a PCR, this is an antibody test. If they are JC positive, then they bring with them the risk for PML if they are on natalizumab, and particularly if they stay on it for a prolonged period of time. If they are JC virus antibody negative, however, 
I put Nautilus and Mad much higher on the list of priorities because taking the JC virus risk off the table and bringing that PML risk down to let's say one in 10,000, one in 20,000, that risk is really much lower and that medicine just as effective become <clears throat> higher on the safety priority, or at least that's how I think of it. And then we can kind of go down the list from there in, in terms of safety. I, I think many of our oral medicines when used well and monitored appropriately are quite safe. And this is a good example of where the handout, the PDF handout that we've distributed to you folks may be useful because it really shows what to monitor in the long term to ensure and maximize the safety of these medicines. And we've all had a patient who comes to us and says, if there's a one in a million risk of something, it's going to happen to me. And even though that's statistically unlikely, I think the perception of risk, the perception of safety is very important for our patients. We don't want them on a medicine that's gonna cause them to go to sleep at night, every night, worried that something terrible is gonna to happen to them. So trying to involve patients in that risk understanding, the safety conversation I think is important. There are patients for whom dose frequency becomes a really driving concern. And I feel like that kind of takes two forms. The patient who really wants something to be dosed infrequently, they don't wanna be constantly reminded of having a diagnosis or they don't want to be constantly responsible for taking a medicine um, or the patient that we worry about their ability to be adherent or compliant with our regimen. That could be because of insurance challenges, of barriers to healthcare. It could be because of our, you know, a cognitive disturbance that that patient has that we think will interfere with their ability to maintain constant dosing. So this is where our infrequently dosed medicines can be very useful to ensure that the medicine reaches the patient and does its work in their system. So oral cladrimine, a series of pills taken on a yearly cycle. So that's something that has a very durable mechanism. And in fact, the way the approval works uh, in the US, it's really two rounds of oral cladrimine and then just observation after that. So sort of from a dose perspective, that's very tantalizing. Alentuzumab, a yearly course of infusions, but it is a much more complicated medicine to use well and monitor the safety. Ocrelizumab, as you've heard, twice yearly infusion, desirable from a dosing perspective. Natalizumab, once a month. So there's at least a built-in monitoring procedure there from the touch program with the nurses at the infusion centers who will ensure that the patient actually shows up and gets their dose. So these are ways of using less frequently dosed medicines to ensure consistency. For many years, as anyone who's been treating patients for more than a decade uh, will recall, for many years, uh, all people wanted to know was when are we going to get pills? Now we have lots of pills. We have lots of different oral medicines. But that whole category has expanded in recent years, and I don't even have all of them on this particular list, though we'll get to some of the newer ones in a moment. But if a patient really does not wish to go to an infusion center and does not wish to do self-injections, oral medicines are very useful. And now we have several mechanisms of action of oral medicines. We have version 2.0s of these, as you heard from Dr. Markowitz, and I'm gonna to touch on as well. So if we're just gonna limit our discussion to pills, we have quite an array of pills um, to discuss with our patients and see what will be the best fit for their lifestyle, their comorbidities, their family planning, their ability to take medicines multiple times a day or every day. That's how I try to focus the conversation. Now, our FDA approvals are usually, well, they're typically based on our clinical trials. Our clinical trials are based on the phenotype of MS that our trials enroll. So for the most part, we have medicines approved for relapsing forms of MS. And for the most part, those medicines were studied in relapsing remitting MS, looking at things like preventing annualized relapse rate, lesions, and disability. But in clinical practice, it is sometimes not obvious whether someone has relapsing remitting MS or a progressive form. And there can be a lot of uncertainty as a patient may transition from relapsing remitting to secondary progressive MS. Um, a paper that we did a few years ago pointed out that there could be several years of uncertainty in the chart as we 
transition from relapsing to secondary progressive MS. Again, my topographical model concept sort of animates between these phenotypes, blurs the distinction between them, because in real life, sometimes we're not sure. So there, I like to go to the data and think, well, what, what do we have in our data sets to suggest that there can be efficacy in these different forms of MS? As you know, ocrelizumab is approved for primary progressive MS on the basis of its successful trial there. In the secondary progressive MS world, um, oral saponimod, an S1P modulator, had a successful secondary progressive MS clinical trial. It was approved for relapsing forms, but the data was for secondary progressive MS. Most of us no longer use mitoxantrone in our practices based on its uh, safety data, so I'm taking that off the list here. But oral cladribine was the first to get this active secondary progressive MS indication, which was then extended to many of our other medicines. So thinking about where there's data for progressive MS overlapping with relapsing MS can help us to use our medicines for patients based on their disease phenotype. With all of this, how can we personalize it? So you've already heard from Dr. Cohen about vaccine risks and infectious risks with our medicines. And to build on that, what I like to do is at the very least get a screening set of infectious exposures when making the disease modifying therapy decision. I will usually do this before I'm gonna make that decision. So if I see a patient for the first time, we're confirming a diagnosis of MS or I'm taking her into my practice, I will send off this panel for the most part if I'm thinking about using these medicines for the patient, the JC virus antibody, which is most important for natalizumab. But remember, there have been PML cases with our other classes of medicines, including our S1P modulators, our fumarates, and our B cell depleters. So although the JC virus antibody is explicitly valuable for deciding PML risk for natalizumab, I, I like to know it for our other medicines as well. We check for tuberculosis with the quantiferon gold, for VZV immunity and think about vaccination, as you just heard, uh, for several of our medicines, a hepatitis panel for our uh, for teraflutamide and our B cell depleters, um, oral cladribine explicitly uh, requests uh, HIV testing. I think it's a good idea to do that for populations that might be at risk in principle uh, before most of our medicines. And then you also heard about looking for MMR uh, and other immunities before patients go on to certain classes of medicine. So this helps to personalize that risk stratification. And, you know, more generally speaking, in the COVID era, I think we've been thinking more about long-term consequences of immune modulation and suppression than we ever did before. Um, MS is a lifelong disease, and we have treatments that can be dosed from twice a day, so 700 plus times a year, to medicines that are given every six months or every year, as you heard. So how long a medicine affects the immune system really varies. That's something I like to talk to patients about. Are they planning to have kids in the next one, two, three, five years? Are they gonna be traveling extensively in the next couple of years? What is their COVID vaccination and kind of COVID risk tolerance like? I think these are things that I figure in when talking to patients about how long these immune medicines last. So I'm just gonna reiterate a couple of things that Dr. Markowitz talked about with this emerging therapies. He went into more detail, but I'm just gonna point out that we do have version 2.0 of several of our categories of medicines now. So in the S1P world, uh, the parent compound was fingolimod from 2010. Siponimod, uh, as I said, its distinguishing feature in my mind is that it was studied in an SPMS trial, the EXPAND trial. It also has some simplicity of starting up that I've listed here, and all of this is shown in the PDF handout. And now more recently, Ozanamod and Ponesamod, uh, more selective S1P modulators, easier to start, don't require the same kind of first dose observation um, uh, uh, and you know, macular edema screening that Fingolimod did back when it was first launched. So several versions of S1P modulators to home in on that and make it a little bit simpler. Similarly, as you also heard from Dr. Markowitz, we don't not only have in the fumarate world, the original dimethyl fumarate from, I guess, 2013 or, or thereabouts, but we also have deroximal fumarate, which has 
a lower incidence of GI side effects, and monomethyl fumarate, as you heard, the, the metabolite that is thought to be biologically active based on the DMF studies. There's also generic dimethyl fumarate, um, which has played a role in how they get these medicines approved uh, and what will be approved for our patients. Um, nobody likes having their hands tied by um, the, the uh, insurance requirements, but it's nice to know that there are these options to ensure that our patients don't have their treatments interrupted. And finally, ocrelizumab was the parent compound in multiple sclerosis. Rituximab has existed for a long time, but it's ocrelizumab that had the B-cell approval in relapsing and primary progressive MS. And then ofatumumab started in relapsing remitting MS, preventing relapses and disability. Very, very similar efficacy data to ocrelizumab in terms of reducing GAD lesions and achieving no evidence of disease activity or NIDA. And this is, as you know, a once monthly sub-Q injection, self-injection. It's kind of a mix of old school self-injection and new school B-cell modulation techniques in this disease. Here are some references, which are just in the slide deck for your reference, which mostly go back to the source data. And again, here is a nod to our handout, which the way it's organized is to look at our medicines by mechanism and talk about what do you need to do before you start one of these drugs? So what do you screen for? What do you ensure you've looked at before initiating the medicine? And what do you monitor once a patient is on one of these drugs to kind of give a framework for how to do safety monitoring? And again, you know, our medicines are very effective. They are generally speaking, very tolerable. And most of the safety issues are things that we can screen for and, and look for. And I think that's really important. And, and it's one of the things I point out to patients when they're starting these medicines. If we screen you for the things and follow the things appropriately that we need to look at, we can optimize the safety and make sure that the medicines are being uh, effective for that person. So I think the handout is helpful. Um, I'm gonna pull it down and distribute it to our fellows and our residents. It might be useful for people in practice to distribute to your staff um, so that they can help with the monitoring process for the medicines that you choose. And with that, I'm gonna conclude my section here and turn it back to uh, our host and lead for the program, Dr. Coyle.